All right, good morning, everyone. If you want to find Amos in chapter 1 and lesson 2. Amos chapter 1 and lesson 2. In fact, we got started on this lesson last week, and, and uh, we would had an introduction to Amos and talked about Amos a little bit and why he was writing the book and some background material and and now we're looking at the prophecies themselves that he had given. And we'll be looking at the prophecies he'd given. Um, we were on page three. We had begun looking at the reasons why Amos, you remember Amos started out and he uh, was giving prophecies concerning judgment coming on other nations besides the northern ten tribes. And um, so we're looking at some reasons why that approach, you know, he certainly followed the Lord's leading in this, but why that approach was taken. And on page two, we talked about the fact it was a means to attract the attention of the Israelites. And it would kind of add some weight to what he had to say to them uh, that followed. And um, then... It was also a reminder to them that God was sovereign over all the affairs of the world. And, uh, you know, besides just the Israelites. And we uh, talked about even though people may not have the law, you know, these other nations, they certainly, a lot of them had a, a, some kind of a knowledge to some degree regarding the Lord through their interaction with the Israelites. And... Uh, the fact that they you know, had a conscience. God had given them a conscience. And uh, so, therefore, they were accountable to God, and God was going to hold them accountable for the things that they had done. And now we're going to pick up. We're on page 3, the book of Amos. We're on page 3 of our lesson. And we're in the book of Amos in chapter 1. And um, so let's look to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll, then we'll begin. Father, we thank you so much for another Lord's Day. And... Father, so much that we can come out and assemble together and do so, Lord, as we believe you'd have us to do. We thank you for your word. We ask now that you would please honor your word and, and give it free course now as we study this book of Amos. Lord, help us to take away from it uh, what is needed in our lives. Lord, we thank you that your word is still relevant today and and that it, uh, even though it may have been originally proclaimed to a group of Israelites thousands of years ago, yet it has meaning for our lives today. So, Lord, help us to uh, see that, and, Lord, by your Spirit, may it be applied to us. Help us to respond in a positive way. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Yeah. Well, I'm going to read uh, three through verses 3 through 5 here in chapter 1 just to kind of get started. and. We as soon as we work through a little more of this introduction, we'll start looking at these individual prophecies. And um, it says, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus, and for four, and we talked about the fact that is a universal introduction to all these uh, announcements of judgment on each one of these nations. You know, same phrases are used for each one, and the fact that that's kind of terminology used for the fact that, you know, that enough is enough on God's perspective. And, you know, the nations had been given, you might say, an opportunity to think about and change their ways. They knew what was wrong. And now God was going to bring about judgment. And he promised that with the next phrase. I says, I will not turn away the punishment thereof. In other words, we had reached to the point that something had to happen. Something had to take place. And then he says here, because they threshed Gilead, Gilead with threshing instruments of iron, but I will send a fire into the house of Hazel, which shall devour the palaces of Ben-Hadad. And I will break into also the bar of Damascus and cut off the inhabitant from the plain of Avon and him that holdeth the scepter from the house of Eden. And the people of Syria shall go into captivity unto Ker, saith the Lord. So if we go back now to page three on our outline and we're looking at number three or point three. Why were these prophecies given? about other nations to the Israelites. And then this is, it was the means by which the Lord would show the Israelites they were just as deserving of God's judgment as were the other nations. 
You know, the Israelites understood the need for justice and punishment for the way the other nations had treated them. You know, we, when you read through these prophecies, some of the nations were guilty of taking the, the Israelites and selling them into captivity as slaves and, and um, along with other atrocities that they committed. So you can imagine the Israelites, you know, they were a little bit of an arrogant people at that time. And as Amos started to deliver these messages, they were probably getting some amens there. <laughs> you, know, you know, go on, Amos, tell them. Tell us about it. And, and uh, then it, the, likely the tune changed when it got down to Judah and Israel itself. But it was to get them to in a position to see that you know they were in the same boat as the rest of these people. Their agreement with Amos' declaration that other nations deserve God's judgment served to demonstrate they were deserving God's judgment also. And then when you get to looking at Israel, they had committed, maybe in a slightly different way, some of the very same sins that God was judging these nations for. And so if they were agreeing that something needed to be done here, then it didn't feel so good when it fell back on them. And, and you know, we're, we're in the same boat that they are. Amos used their agreement with what he said with the other nations to put them all in a position before God that they could not truthfully deny. And so, you know, if you're going to say, yeah, he's deserving of judgment because of his sin, and I've done the same thing, then I might as well be pointing to myself as well. And... Uh, so he's going to put them in that kind of in that position where they couldn't deny that they were deserving of God's judgment. Next, this was the means by which God's patience with the sinful Gentile nations and sinful Israel is made evident. You know, God's judgment comes after sinful and rebellious activity that continues over a period of time. You know, God, and we've studied this through the other, looking at Hosea and, and, and Joel, and you know from other uh, portions of Scripture that God is a patient God. Uh, I'm thankful for that in my life. And, and you know, God could execute, rightfully execute judgment immediately if he, you know, if he chose to do so. And we'd be right in doing it. Uh, but none of us would be here if, you know, if he did that. And so uh, God gives space to, to make change and to repent. What Amos stated at the beginning of each announcement of judgment on a nation, where it says for three transgressions and for four, he was saying that the nations had been repeatedly sinning, and that their sins had reached a point that demanded God's judgment. You know, God would rather extend his grace and mercy than exercise his wrath. People get hardened towards the Lord to the point they do not respond to his appeals to repent and receive his forgiveness. And in Jeremiah, you know, we uh, have that. Jeremiah 19 and 15. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring upon this city and upon all her towns all the evil that I have pronounced against it, because they have hardened their necks, that they might not hear my words. And so, you know, God sent warning. God sent his prophets. God sent people saying, you know, what you're doing is wrong. Repent, turn to the Lord, and, you know, I'll forgive you and spare you. But they refused, you know, to do that. And so... When that ha takes place and that happens, that hardness of heart sits in, then God has to judge. In those situations, God's judgment will surely take place, which is evidenced by the repeated phrase, I will not turn away the punishment thereof. In other words, you know, there was no other way to deal with the situation when the people were unwilling to, to change and repent. There have been many individual Israelites there may have been many uh, Israelite individuals upon hearing God's judgment was coming who would humble themselves before God, repent of their sin, and turn to the Lord. You know, you don't know if everyone that heard Amos' preaching hardened their heart further. You know, hopefully there were some that, that recognized, you know, the situation they were in and, and repented and turned to the Lord. History would prove that the vast majority of the Israelites, though, particularly the nation's leadership, did not turn to God and therefore experienced his judgment as a result. You know, eventually the ten northern tribes, as we knew from you know, studying the book of Hosea, that the Assyrians came and, and uh, carried them away captive, you know, the ones that were not killed at that time. The next point, this was the means by which God reminded the Israelites that not only does he observe how people treat each other, but people's treatment of Others matters very much to him as well. You know, 
sometimes we forget, you know, God sees everything we do. He observes everything that goes on in this world. And uh, you know, maybe we think nobody else will s- is looking, you know, we'll do something we shouldn't. We might know it's wrong, and you know, nobody will see me, and I'll, I'll get away with it. But, you know, God sees, and we, he doesn't let it get by him. You know, God is offended by all sin. There's not a single sin on this earth that is committed by people that God approves of. But he is very offended when people take advantage of others. And that's what was going on often in the northern ten tribes when you get to studying about Israel itself. You know, they uh, took advantage of others and treated others with disrespect and mistreated the weak or the defenseless. They failed to love others as they loved themselves, were to love themselves. And all these things were addressed in the Old Testament. Uh, you know, back in Exodus twenty-two, twenty-two, you know, the Israelites were commanded to not uh, afflict any widow or a fatherless child. You know, in Leviticus nineteen, fourteen, uh, you know, they were not to curse the deaf or put a stumbling block uh, before the blind. You know. What a mean thing to do, knowing somebody's blind and you put something in front of them they don't, not aware of, just to see them trip and fall. You know, uh, you know those type of things that people do to each other are just simply meanness and 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 ugliness in the heart. Um, in Leviticus nineteen eighteen, then you know the Israelites were commanded to to love others as as themselves. You know, the Lord repeated that over in the New Testament. You know. Uh, so it wasn't like the Israelites didn't know these things and weren't aware of these things. And yet, you know, they, like these other nations, were uh, guilty of committing the same sins. This was the main theme of Amos. You know, he doesn't address idolatry too much in this uh, book, but he does address a whole lot how people have treated each other. Amos declares that such behaviors will incur God's severe judgment. And that's evidence through all these things he had to say to the nations and to Judah and Israel. Now, besides Israel, Amos announced the Lord's judgment on seven nations that were in close proximity to Israel. You know, you have Israel and then you had you know, Syria or Damascus kind of to the northeast and, and Phoenicia up on the northwest and then you had all along below there was Judah down kind of south of them, and and you had the Philistines or Philistia on the uh, to the southwest, and then a lot of the other these nations were on the east side of the Jordan River, and so they were all in proximity to the northern ten tribes, included in the declaration of the coming judgment for each of the nations was fire. You know, if you look at each one of these prophecies here, you see the mention of fire, and. Uh, and we all know this, fire can be very destructive. Uh, you know, it often back in those days was used as a weapon for war. You, know, you went in and, and you conquered the city, you, you torched it. And, and you made it as much as you could uh, uninhabitable. And you know, often there, if there were walls around the city, those were, were tore down and, and all sorts of things. Maybe they would stone the field so crops couldn't be grown. I mean, on and on. But fire was one of the things they used to, uh, because of its destructive nature. You know, fire can also consume that which is bad, and and you know, the writer of Hebrews describes describes God as a consuming fire, in Hebrews twelve twenty nine, and all that is contrary to God's perfect holiness will be removed from His presence. You know, this world and all these that's on it, you know, at some point in the future is going to be judged by fire. And, you know, it's going to be burned up and God will make a new heaven and a new earth. And so what's contrary to God will be judged by fire, consumed by fire in the future. And as we read there a minute ago, the first one of these locations is to be judged is, is Damascus. And Amos's prophecy was directed at Damascus since the city was the strongest of all the cities that were part of the Aramean kingdom. And... Um, Damascus is an old, old, old city. It's been around for centuries and centuries. Uh, now, the Arameans were also known as the Syrians. That's, you know, the country of Syria today. That's a name that's been carried forward for thousands of years. And, um, you know, it's still the, the main city within the nation or country of Syria today. 
Now, Damascus is located to the northeast of Israel. Now, the Arameans were one of Israel's greatest enemies for a period of approximately 100 years. It's interesting that you go back and look, and Elijah, the prophet Elijah, anointed Hazael to be king of Syria back in 1 Kings 19.15. You know, and I'm sure, you know, you wonder what all Elijah's interaction with him was, what Elijah had to say to him about the Lord. And, and uh, so they weren't blind or lacked knowledge concerning God because of their interaction with some of the prophets of God. Elisha, in a direct meeting with Hazael, declared that Hazael would become king of Syria and would attack Israel and commit great atrocities against them. You know, he we wept in the presence of Hazael, and, and it was because he saw the Lord gave him a vision regarding what uh, Hazael and his armies would do to some of the Israelites. And, and uh, so you can read that in 2 Kings chapter 8. Now, God used the Syrians under King Hazael to bring judgment upon Israel. And I'm giving you some scripture references for that. Now, this judgment continued on under the reign of Benadad, Hazael's son. The Assyrians then attacked the Arameans, which allowed the Israelites to regain all the land that had been lost to Aram under the leadership of King Josiah and King Jeroboam II. You know, particularly Jeroboam II. And uh, that's where God had, had mercy on the nation of the northern ten tribes and, and allowed them to to expand and to prosper materially. And we've talked about that several times. Now, Amos made know the Arameans why they were coming under God, the Lord's judgment. It was due to the Arameans' terrific, horrific treatment of the Israelites that were residing in Gilead when they conquered the area. Now, Gilead is a part of the uh, uh, nation of Israel that was on the east side of the Jordan, kind of on the northern, northeast side of the Jordan from the rest of Israel. And of course, you know, some of the tribes had settled and partial tribes had settled into that area when they took the promised land. And so they were, I guess you'd say, the most remote, remote part from, the, from Jerusalem and, and the main part of Israel. And that was the part of, of Israel that the Arameans, which was directly north of this area, when they conquered uh, parts of Israel, that they, they conquered. One of the means used in ancient times to remove the seeds from a plant's stalks was a heavy sledge or sleigh-like thing repeatedly pulled by draft animals over to the crop being threshed. The heavy sledge would have a knife-like iron prongs attached to the bottom of the sledge. So the captive Israelites were threshed by the Arameans, as it talked about here. In other words, the people don't know how they went about doing it, whether they tied them up and laid them down or what, but then they, they took these instruments of threshing in these animals and just drove them right across the top of these people. And, and you know, you can imagine what happened. And, and, you know, war is ugly no matter what, but it seemed like these nations at that time would do things to create a sense of fear and, and all in the hearts of those they conquered. And Hazael or somebody that was uh, one of his advisors hatched this thing up in their mind, you know, we'll... we'll teach these Israelites some lessons. We'll show them how bad it is when they have to deal with us. Anyway, God saw what went on, and, and um, you know, he considered it something being unjustifiable even in times of war. You know? And so uh, here you see an extreme case where a group of people mistreated you know, others beyond what was even expected. Although people may show through their behavior that they do not value human life, they have no valid reason for doing so. You know, you know, this is time of war, but it don't mean you, you don't take in consideration other people. You don't have to be just uh, downright brutal and, and all that so often happens in that time. Then here's a quote. It says, War or no war, Hazael had no liberty to treat people as if they were things. It is the first absolute moral principle for which Amos campaigns. People are not things. Threshing is what a man does to a thing, a grain crop, in order to extract profit from it. This is what Hazael did to, in Gilead. He treated people as things, but found no sympathy or an allowance or forgiveness in heaven. In other words, God saw and he saw the depth of, of the ugliness of it and the, and the horror of it and the devaluation of, of humanity that was involved there and so God was going to bring his judgment on the 
Haziel and, and his people. In addition to the palaces of Haziel being destroyed by fire, the bar of Damascus, or the main gate, was destroyed, allowing invaders to enter into the city. And so, you know, the gates were places that built in the walls where they were open to let people in and out, you know, of a city. And it was often those locations that were attacked in times of war by the nations, you know, to try to break through. Apparently that uh, didn't happen, um, happened here when, when they conquered Damascus. The people that dwelt in the plain of Avon. Now the word Avon means wickedness. So the, it was a plain of wickedness or a center of pagan worship were killed, it talks about. And so certainly God despised the, the false worship and the idolatry that the, Assyr- the Assyrians were involved in. It says the house of Eden or the house of pleasure, which referred to the summer palace of King Rezin, who was also killed. And so, you know, God was going to destroy, uh, you know, the, the places of, of idolatrous worship. He was going to destroy the places that involved the uh, homes of, of the leadership of the country. And, um, you know, the Syrians who survived were to, taken captive and sent to a place called Kerr. Some scholars believe that Kerr was a place of origin for the Assyrians and was located in the Mesopotamian region. And uh, a little note we'll see over further on over in Amos chapter 9, verse 7. Now this prophecy was fulfilled when the Assyrians under Tiglath-Pilzer destroyed Damascus in 732 B.C. And we even have an account in the Bible, 2 Kings in chapter 16, which uh, talks about that. And so what God said he would do, you know, he did and because of the sin of the Syrians. Next on their list was Philistia, you know, the place where the Philistines lived. And we'll read 6 through 8, verse 8. It says, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza, and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they carried away captive the whole captivity to deliver them up to Edom. But I will send a fire on the wall of Gaza, which shall devour the palaces thereof. And I will cut off the inhabitant from Ashdod, and him that holdeth the scepter from Ashkelon. And I will turn my hand against Ekron, and the remnant of the Philistines shall perish, saith the Lord. And so they were going to get it pretty rough. (laughs) Another group of people that remained an enemy of Israel for many centuries were the Philistines. Now you you read your Bible in the times of King Saul and King David particularly, they were just constantly fighting with the Philistines. And sometimes it was back and forth. You know, Goliath was, you know, a soldier for the Philistines. And um, when David, you know, killed him. And so they, they were constantly, almost seemed like constantly at war uh, for a period of time. The nation was composed of five city-states, Gaza, Ashkelon, Ashdod, Ekron, and Gath. And, uh, you know, so you see these names mentioned in this prophecy. And so he's talking about, you know, the entire Philistine nation. Their ongoing conflict with Israel was primarily driven by their desire to expand the territory under their control. They didn't have a whole large amount of land. If you look at the maps of the ancient nations, they occupied a little area right along the Mediterranean coast, kind of just to the northeast of, of Egypt and on the southwest side of Israel. They didn't have a huge amount of territory, and so they were probably just looking for a way to expand the amount of land that they could control and maybe grow crops on and so forth and so on. And so it was that constant push against Israel. Now, the Philistines were capable militarily using strong weapons and chariots made of iron. When you, you know, read the account about Goliath and you know the type of weapons and the armor that he he had that uh, you know speaks to, you know they they were probably pretty formidable to fight against and uh, it was due to the ongoing conflict being experienced with the Philistines that Israel wanted a human king to lead them now Israel's first king Saul and his son Jonathan were killed by the Philistines the Philistines were subdued by King David but continued to present problems to Judah and the northern ten tribes even through Amos's time so you know this covers quite a few centuries and uh, so they were, they were there. They, you know, always a, a conflict going on. Now the Philistines did not value human life either, but it was in a different way than Arameans. 
they sought to exploit others for what value could be gained. The people that they took captive in war were treated as a commodity from which they sought to get as much profit as possible. Sometimes they took people captive not because they were at war with the nation attacked, but so they might capture people to sell as slaves to another nation, such as Edom. They were guilty of being heavily involved in human trafficking. Using others for personal profit was the sin that the Philistines were judged for. And Amos made it very clear that God would not allow such treatment of others to go unpunished. And so it, you know, it talks about here, um, it says they carried away captive the whole captivity to deliver them up to Edom. And so they just they saw other people as something to be traded, you know, to make money off of and, and to improve their economy. And uh, so uh, you certainly don't think very highly of other people when, when you're involved in that type of thing. Amos declared that Gaza would be destroyed by fire. Ashdod would be destroyed with no one residing thereafter. The king of Ashkelon would die. And the phrase, I will turn my hand, means I will turn my power. You know, they were going to experience the power of God's judgment and, and the, how absolute it was. And uh, God would unleash his power and judgment on the Philistines. You know, apparently none of the Philistines would survive his judgment. It says the remnant of the Philistines shall perish. You know, remnant refers to the small group that's left. And apparently even they would be uh, killed or put to death. God's judgment resulted in the complete destruction of the Philistine nation. If some listening would doubt this happening, Amos concluded his prophecy with, saith the Lord God, there at the end of verse 8. I think that was put in there by emphasis saying, you know, if you think otherwise, you know, I'm saying this is the way it's going to be. And and if I say this way it's going to be, it's the way it's going to be. And um, <clears throat> This prophecy was fulfilled by the Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar. And so when, you remember when Nebuchadnezzar came down and conquered Judah and, and eventually destroyed the temple and took away the, you know, the Israelites that, or Judeans that remained behind, a lot of them captive, you know, they also uh, destroyed the Philistines as well. In fact, the Babylonians uh, took care of a whole lot of these other little nations uh, that's mentioned here. Next is Tyre. It says, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyrus, and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they delivered up the whole captivity to Edom, and remembered not the brotherly covenant. But I will send a fire on the wall of Tyrus, which shall devour the palaces thereof. Now the city of Tyre was a seaport located on the Mediterranean coast north of Israel, and now what is the nation of Lebanon. The city controlled most of Phoenicia during the time of Amos. Now, the, Phoenicia was kind of on the northwest, on up north of, you might say, Israel there along the Mediterranean coast. You, know, you had Tyre and you had Sidon, and I think there were some other cities that were part. It is a pretty small nation as well, uh, land as far as the land that it occupied. Now, the Phoenicians were seafarers and became wealthy by being the middleman in the handling of commodities. It was kind of like... Today, you know, you have the wholesalers, you know, the ones that buy in bulk and then they sell to the retailer. They were kind of like the wholesalers. And um, they would send a ship out over to another part of the world and, and purchase things and bring it back and sell it to cover the cost of the shipping plus an increase. You know, they were, that's how they were making their profit. Included in them, one of those commodities was slaves. And so they often, I think, linked up with the the Philistines in carrying out this terrible business. Apparently one of their customers when trading slaves was Edom. And so, you know, the Edomites were on the receiving end a lot of times of this matter, particularly when it comes to the Israelites. As bad as the sin was, it was made worse when they sold Edom some Israelites, you know, their friends. Why do you say that? Because in the time of King David and King Solomon, Israel appeared to be on good terms with, with Tyre. Uh, you know, Solomon referred to King Hiram of Tyre as his brother. And so it was, you know, through Hiram that David and Solomon acquired the things they needed to build the temple. And there was kind of an understanding between, you know, Israel and, and, and Tyre. And so uh, it's almost like when Tyre did what they did regarding the Israelites, they were 
uh, backstabbing them. You know, they were, were taking advantage of, of the friendship that the countries had enjoyed. Now, Tyre's actions were unprovoked by Israel, which never attacked Tyre. However, Psalm 83 describes Tyre as being one of the several nations that intended to destroy Israel. You know, they were all smiles and handshakes when they're face to face, but when they were talking to somebody else, yeah, we're going to get rid of that crowd. And, and so, uh, you know, it was pretty two-faced, apparently. Um, Tyre was guilty of turning against another nation that it once made an agreement with in order that it might gain monetarily as a result of such actions. As a result of their sin, God declared he would destroy Tyre. Now, the Babylonians, if you remember, Tyre was, had a section of the city that was on the mainland, and then there was a, another part that was out here on an island with a kind of a causeway or something other attaching the two. And the, the Babylonians had conquered you know, the part that was on the mainland. And um, then you remember under Alexander the Great, you know, the prophecy was completely fulfilled on Alexander the Great when the Greeks conquered the remaining portion that was located on the island in 332 B.C. Historical reveals, records reveal at that time some 6,000 inhabitants of Tyre were killed and 30,000 were sold into slavery. So they kind of got what they had coming uh, in that regard. And so here again we see God's prophecy, God's, what he said he would do, you know, came true. Next on the list was Edom. And it says here, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom, and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because he did pursue his brother with the sword, and did cast off all pity, and his anger did tear perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. But I'll send a fire upon Teman, which shall devour the palaces of Basra. If you remember, the Edomites were the descendants of Esau. You remember that story. Now, Esau was Jacob's brother, and God, God had commanded the Israelites to not abhor the Edomites, since they were to be considered as a brother. There in Deuteronomy 23, 7. You know, as the Israelites were coming up and getting ready to cross over the Jordan, you know, God said, leave the Edomites alone. You know, don't attack them and you know, don't bother them because of the relationship that was there from back in the days of Jacob and, and Esau. However, conflict between the two nations started with the conflict that developed between the brothers Jacob and Esau. You know, Jacob and Esau kind of made amends when, when Jacob returned back from uh, Laban, back to the promised land. But a lot of the four generations, the generations after that, I think still held a lot of uh, uh, resentment and, and hatred in the hearts towards the Israelites. Some never forgave their lights, apparently. The same thinking about e of Esau about what happened between Jacob and him appeared to continue in the minds of the Edomites towards the Israelites. You remember Jacob stole or deceived his father and got the birthright that was, should have been Esau's. And probably you had all these Edomites who were saying over the years, you know, if Jacob hadn't done that and Esau had got the birthright, you know, we'd be over there in the promised land and on and on and on and on. And, and so... They thought they had been treated wrong, and, and that wrong had never been corrected. <clears throat> we see that, kind of a reference to that, in Hebrews 12, 15, 17, and Amos 1, 12. And um, their relationship with the Jews was con controlled by their anger and their resentment and their hatred and their bitterness. Even at its best, the relationship between the two nations was tense, but often there was open warfare and some scripture references to that. Now, the reasons for God's judgment on Edom were that they, at a very opportunity, at every opportunity available, sought to inflict physical harm on the Israelites. You know, it's kind of like when a person gets down, somebody else runs in and adds a kick, or does something else, to, you know, to, to keep them in the position they're in. Instead of showing compassion as God expected of them, they chose to bring some form of suffering on the Israelites. This was very evident when they took advantage of the victory of the Babylonians to plunder anything they considered valuable and to take captives as for sale as slaves and cruelly kill other Israelites who managed to survive the Babylonian onslaught. So the Babylonians, you know, conquered Judah in that area, you know, but they hadn't did anything to, to the Edomites. And the Edomites saw that, you know, these Israelites were down and, and 
uh, they were in a bad way. They they just stepped in behind the Babylonians and and uh, what the Babylonians left behind, they if that's something they wanted, they took it. And if there were Israelites still living or trying to get back on their feet, so to speak, that were take were not taken captive by the Babylonians, you know they they either sold some of those as slaves or took them back as slaves or or killed them or whatever way they could to uh, mistreat them. And so they added insult. To injury and to injury, you might say. Teman and Bosworth were very important cities or areas in Edom where military, political, and religious power was centered. If these areas were destroyed, then Edom would cease to function as a nation. This prophecy is fulfilled when Assyria conquered Edom in the 8th century B.C. Three centuries later, the area was a desert wasteland inhabited by nomads. God is very concerned about how people treat their friends and their family. He is also very concerned with how people treat others who are considered to be an enemy. You know, God is is um, you know, He's good to those who don't love Him. You know, you hear Matthew talk about that. He sends the rain, He sends the sun on the just and the unjust. You know, God extends His common grace to a lot of unbelievers in this world, and and blesses them materially and in a lot of ways which they never acknowledge or give one thanks to God for. And you know, so here it is with the, with the Edomites. You know, they, by virtue of, of their relationship with the Israelites, should have treated them differently. You know, they were distant kin. And instead, they treated them as an enemy and sought every opportunity they could to, to hurt and inflict and, and kill. And so that's why they were judged. i got a few minutes. We'll look at Ammon. It says, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of the children of Ammon and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they have ripped up the women with the child of Gilead, that they might enlarge their border. But I will kindle a fire in the wall of Rabbah, and it shall devour the palaces thereof, with the shouting in the day of battle, with a tempest in the day of the whirlwind. And their king shall go into captivity, he and his princes together, saith the Lord. You know, like the Edomites, the Ammonites were distant relatives of the Israelites. They descended from Ben Ami, who was the son of Lot's youngest daughter, and her incestuous relationship with Lot. You know, all that took place after, you know, the judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, and Lot, you know, had to leave. <clears throat> and you can read about that in Genesis. You know, the Ammonites lived in an area east of the Jordan River, with Aram to the north and Gilead to the west and Moab to the south. So they were kind of a landlocked little group. You know, to the east of them was all this Arabian desert, which was totally uninhabitable pretty much. And so they were kind of squeezed in there. And the area they occupied was part of the, the modern nation of Jordan today. And um, it says, like other ancient nations, the Am- Ammonites sought opportunity to expand the territory and control by the nation, particularly since they were limited due to being surrounded by these other nations. And so there was that constant push against others and constant war. You know, the Israelites had a long history of act- hostile activity against the Ammonites. When the Israelites were at the point of entering the promised land, they were commanded by God to leave the Ammonites alone, since he had given the land they occupied as an inheritance to Lot and his descendants. Moses mentioned that back in Deuteronomy. Ammon had united with other nations to attack Israel several times over the years. <clears throat> you read about that in Judges 3 and 2 Kings 24. At other times, the Israelites you know, had attacked the Ammonites. You know, they, it went both ways. And uh, so... You know, to some degree, both sides were guilty, you might say. Now, the Ammonites were being judged for their horrific acts of violence committed against pregnant Israelite women during one or more of the times that the Ammonites attacked Israel. You know, we talked about this before, uh, looking at back in some of the other counts of the other nations. You know, it's a, it is a terrible thing, you know, to come in and when you're conquering a land, you not only... Uh, kill the soldiers and, and others that resist against it, but you go so far as to kill women, even pregnant women, and, and the child, child that they're bearing. And, and so, you know, a total risk, disregard for human life. And, um, you know, other nations, you were, such as Assyria and Aram and Babylon, were guilty of this same thing. Such acts of brutality were performed to create a sense of t- fear in the minds of the citizens of a nation's enemies and to reduce the ability of the conquered nation to get revenge or gain freedom from the control of the conquered nation. You, you go in and they would conquer a nation and say they would kill a whole group of children 
that from the unborn to a certain age. And what you were doing is reducing the potential for that nation in the future to, you'd have a weakened generation. You, there would be inability to, to raise an army as much, an effective army. They'd be in, uh, unable to be as strong uh, economically and all those things. So they, in their minds, they were saying, well, this is a way which we can you know, not only conquer a nation, but we can weaken it you know, in the future. And um, so this type of thing, God certainly didn't approve of either. You know, the kings and military leadership of ancient countries thought this type of treatment of the enemy is just part of waging war. You know, this is what you do to get ahead. But God declared he was going to severely judge the Ammonites for the way they treated the individuals who were helpless. One of the acts of man that motivates God to execute his vengeance more quickly and harshly is the unwarranted, cruel mistreatment of the individuals who are unable to defend themselves. In other words, in the shedding of innocent blood. I think it's going to come a time if things don't get turned around in this nation regarding abortion, we're going to pay the price. You know, it's almost this very thing right here. And uh, so, as a result of God's judgment, the capital the city of Rabbah would be destroyed and the king and the leadership of the nation would be taken away captive. Assyria and Babylon was used by God to subdue and take away the independent status of the Ammonites. One of the last times that Ammon was mentioned is in historical accounts was when Ammon was defeated at the hands of the Maccabeans near the middle of the 2nd century B.C. You know, the Maccabeans were the Israelites who revolted and rose up and revolted and uh, achieved some form of independence for a short period of time. And uh, you know they seemingly maybe were the ones used to finally get rid of the rest of the Ammonites. But as we see here, God, in all these cases you see, it's, it's a case where people mistreat other people and, and devalue other people and, and consider themselves less than someone who's made in the image of God. And, and therefore, God's judgment rightfully so is administered. And what God said he would do, you know, he did in each case. And so I think he was establishing in the minds of the Israelites, you know, when he got to them that, you know, you're worthy of my judgment as well, and, and you saw what I did, or what happened to others will happen to you as well. So we'll pick up there next time.